Although the primary symptom of stammering, the temporary inability to initiate the muscle movements required for speech, is beyond our direct control, we do have the potential to exert quite considerable voluntary control over our secondary symptoms. In this slideshow, I'll try to clarify in a bit more detail how your understanding of the nature of your secondary symptoms can help you to instigate changes that can have a lasting beneficial impact on your speech. Bear in mind that any learnt response to the inability to initiate execution of a speech plan constitutes a secondary behaviour. Secondary behaviours may be self-taught, either on purpose or by chance, but they may also have been taught to you during speech therapy. In this regard, it's important to remember also that some secondary behaviours are positively beneficial, whereas others, including some that are taught by therapists, very definitely do more harm than good. In order to be able to change our secondary symptoms, we first have to identify them. Unfortunately, this is not quite as straightforward a process as it may sound. As Van Riper pointed out, many people who stammer have very little awareness of what they do when they stammer, and our tendency to lump all of our symptoms together under the same label of stammering or stuttering contributes to that lack of awareness. However, the lack of awareness is also because many of the secondary symptoms of stammering are very subtle. Many of them resemble behaviours that also occur in the speech of people who do not stammer. So, for example, when you anticipate a potential block ahead, your first response may be to slow down or to produce fillers such as um or er, or change the stress or intonation pattern. You may say the in situations where it would be more appropriate to say the, and a in situations where it would be more appropriate, appropriate to say a. Uh. Or you may use in, interjections such as actually or like more frequently than you otherwise would. All these behaviours also occur in the speech of non-stammerers, especially at times of word-finding difficulties or when trying to decide what to say. None of these behaviours are harmful when used to buy some time and to hold the listener's attention during moments of word-finding difficulty or when trying to decide what to say. Indeed, at such times they're positively helpful inasmuch as they help to hold the listener's attention. However, if you habitually use them before anticipated stammering, despite the fact that you already know exactly what words you want to say, using them in this way will reinforce the tendency to anticipate stammering, and in the long run will make you stammer more. So, although they're fine, when you have word-finding difficulties, or when you're still formulating what you want to say, when used to stall before anticipated stammering, such behaviours are just as much of a problem as the gross and more obviously abnormal secondary, se secondary behaviours that people tend to more characteristically associate with stammering. A useful way of increasing your awareness of your use or misuse of these subtle secondary symptoms is to video yourself engaging in real-life conversations and then carefully watch the video to determine exactly what symptoms you produce. Mindfulness practice can also help. As I previously mentioned, we do have quite considerable voluntary control over the secondary symptoms that we produce especially the later developing avoidance and escape behaviours. With a little willpower, we can easily stop ourselves producing them. However, no matter how undesirable our secondary symptoms may appear to be, they almost certainly also fulfil some important communicative, communicative, communicative functions. Unless we take these functions into account and find alternative ways of fulfilling them, Stopping our secondary symptoms will cause other problems.
For example, the production of repetitions, prolongations and fillers at or before the start of a word that you're having difficulty saying will help to alert listeners to the fact that you stammer and will signal to them that you're trying to speak and having difficulty getting a word out. So such behaviours increase the likelihood that the listener will wait for you and finish uh, will wait for you to finish what you're trying to say. If you try, you can quite easily stop yourself producing repetitions, prolongations or, f or fillers, in which case the stammer will then most likely manifest as a silent block instead. However, this cre creates a dilemma, because if you just block and don't produce any other symptoms, it's likely that whoever you're speaking to will think that you've finished speaking, and it's likely that they'll therefore not continue to wait for you to get the words out. One solution to this dilemma is, when you find yourself getting stuck, instead of repeating or prolonging or resorting to the use of force, you can simply skip the word that you're blocking on and carry on with whatever words you can say. The fluency enhancing technique that we call the jump involves this approach and will be discussed in detail in the next module. Alternatively, you may be able to substitute some other word that has a similar meaning that you can say. Word substitution is fine as long as you only resort to it in order to get yourself going again after you've already got stuck. It's not okay to substitute words in response to the mere anticipation that you might get stuck. Doing that will just reinforce your fear of getting stuck and will ultimately make you more likely to get stuck in the future. The use of force and other abnormal escape behaviours to push words out is definitely harmful in the long term. However, in the short term, such behaviours do fulfil some important roles. In particular, they also serve to hold listeners' attention and increase the likelihood that they'll continue to pay attention to you while you're trying to speak. And of course, occasionally such behaviours do actually help you to get the words out. So, in order to be able to successfully stop yourself using force, you'll need to find an alternative way of getting the words out that is at least as quick and equally effective at holding the listener's attention. Again, the technique that we call the jump can fulfil this role, as can word substitution, but again, only use word substitution after having tried to say the word that you want to say and failed. Never use it to avoid words that you anticipate difficulty with. Of all the secondary symptoms, arguably avoidance is one of the most problematic. Most people who stammer at least sometimes avoid words, situations or people that trigger their stammering. Such avoidance may prevent them from communicating effectively and in the long run it'll reinforce their tendency to fear the situations that they successfully avoid. Consequently, avoidance keep and plays a key role in causing stammering to persist. Also, if you use avoidance to try and hide your stammer from other people, it can lead to serious psychological problems with self-identity and self-esteem. However, avoidance of feared words, situations and people does also fulfil some useful functions. And we need to bear this in mind if you want to find ways of overcoming it. In particular, avoidance can protect you from traumatic experiences that may otherwise sometimes result from severe stammering and from associated negative listener responses. So when you decide to stop avoiding the words, situations and people that you're afraid of, you need to have a reliable alternative way of getting your message across should you find yourself getting stuck and unable to move forward. Otherwise, you risk being traumatised by your disfluencies or by people's reactions to them. Essentially, this means that you need to already be sufficiently proficient at using a fluency-enhancing technique so that you can be confident that you'll be able to quickly and easily get started again if you do find yourself blocking. 
or otherwise you need to have an alternative reliable communication means available and ready to use if necessary such as a pen and paper. Having identified what secondary symptoms you produce it's helpful to consider which of your secondary symptoms are most harmful. In this regard, it's important to bear in mind that often the long-term impact of a behaviour is opposite to its short-term impact, and that some of the most harmful secondary behaviours are the ones that appear to bring the most immediate relief or benefits. So, for example, avoiding speaking in situations where you anticipate you will stammer may bring an instant feeling of relief, but in the long term, it leads to an overall increase in a number of situations where you anticipate that you'll stammer. In contrast, allowing some mild stammering may increase your discomfort in the short term, but may ultimately lead to a long-term reduction in your, f in your fear of stammering. Secondary behaviours that lead to extreme discomfort in the short term are, however, very likely to be harmful both in the short term as well as in the long term. And any stammering related experience that is highly traumatic is likely to increase your anticipation and fear of stammering in the future. So, although avoidance of situations where you're likely to produce mild stammering is generally not a good idea, it generally is good to stop speaking if you find yourself starting to, pr to produce severe stammering symptoms or if listeners are responding very negatively to your stammer. If you allow yourself to become traumatised, this can have a long-term impact, not only on your stammering, but also on your well-being generally. In my experience, many stammerers exhibit symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, and are able to trace these symptoms back to one or more particularly traumatic situations. Uh, particularly traumatic experiences of stammering. This is something to bear in mind when trying to practice non-avoidance and when trying to expand your comfort zones. It's better to stop if you find yourself starting pr to produce severe stammering symptoms or if listeners start to respond highly negatively towards you. Managing emotional arousal. Emotional arousal and in particular anxiety, play significant roles in stammering. Although there's no evidence that anxiety contributes to the onset of stammering, it can increase the severity of stammering in people who stammer. And stammering can increase the severity of anxiety. Emotional arousal influences speech in a number of ways. In particular, it causes changes to the tone of the voice. So, for example, you can tell from the tone of a person's voice whether or not they're anxious or angry. It also increases the frequency of speech errors. It's important to understand that anxiety and other emotions are not under our direct voluntary control. You can't just decide not to be anxious. So, despite all that people may say, Trying to relax or trying not to be anxious in stammering situations is completely counterproductive. You may, however, be able to reduce your levels of emotional arousal more generally in indirect ways through forms of cognitive therapy such as CBT and mindfulness or by making adjustments to your lifestyle. However, from moment to moment, with regard to speech and stammering, the best approach is simply to accept the inevitability of some emotional arousal and to keep going regardless. Feel the fear and do it anyway is a good motto to remember. The one exception to this is in situations where emotional arousal is so strong that you're likely to be traumatised by it. In such cases, as explained in previous slides, it's probably better to stop. Ultimately, secondary symptoms are the ways we learn to deal with stammering blocks. Some of them very definitely do more harm than good. Others are relatively neutral and some are positively beneficial. The usefulness of specific secondary symptoms 
varies according to the situation you find yourself in. Repetitions and prolongations have their place, and sometimes avoidance is the best response. Although stammerers are generally able to predict when they're about to block, some blocks nevertheless happen completely unexpectedly. When this happens, you likely find yourself spontaneously producing whatever secondary symptoms you habitually produce. So there are bound to continue to be times when you produce some of the less helpful, more extreme secondary symptoms. There's no point beating yourself up about this. Ultimately, it doesn't matter all that much. But do stop as soon as you realize that you're producing extreme symptoms. Use a technique if you can, or find another mode of communication, or otherwise just give up and try again another time. Whatever the case, avoid allowing yourself to be traumatized, even if doing so sometimes means not getting your message across.